I am Catherine Skinner. I'm the executive director of the Educopia Institute. And on behalf of the Next Generation Library Publishing Team, we're really, really glad to have you here. So this webinar today is going to introduce you to, or in some cases, uh, update you on the Next Generation Library Publishing Project. And our framing structure for today's presentation is going to mirror the framing structure that we use within the project itself. And it's based on the guiding principles for our project, which you see in front of you on this slide, uh, community, interoperability, scalability, and sustainability. And associated with each one of those core principles that we use to guide our work is a foundational question. And so part of what we will be doing as we go through today's presentation is we'll touch on each one of those guiding questions that are associated with those four principles. And then we're gonna share an overview of the work that we're doing to answer that question, including the outputs that we've uh, created so far and the next steps that we have uh, both in the, the near future and then hopefully also in a longevity kind of uh, perspective. At the end of each section of this presentation, we're also gonna be posing a, a question back to you all. So we'd love your thoughts on these questions during today's session. And we'll also be reaching out in lots of other ways to gather more feedback on these in the coming months. But if you have thoughts today, as we get to those guiding questions and you'll know when they come, I'll, I'll signal you and so we'll uh, copy eyes as they're uh, presenting. Please just share back with us in the chat. Um, and there are almost 200 people registered today. So it is gonna be chat-based rather than conversation-based though, though we wish we could have uh, open conversation with everyone. So at the end of this session, we're gonna give you a number of ways that you can get involved with the project if you're not already. Uh, this is very much a community-driven initiative and we do hope that you'll add your voice to the community if you've not already done so. Pending some of your feedback from how you feel about today's event, we do plan to host some additional community forums in the coming months as well as the project work really begins to come into fruition with some open outputs that we hope many of you are gonna be able to use to concretely impact the field and you know, the world at large. The most important thing that I want you all to hear from me right now though, is that we want you involved. So we've designed this initiative to bring in community voices at every aspect of the work. And, uh, and we really do invite you um, wholeheartedly to come to the table with us. So with that said, the first guiding question of our work is, can we put community at the core of transformative change in scholarly publishing? And those of you who know Educopia know that this emphasis on community is not hand-waving. We really believe in the power of community to drive change, and we're immersed daily in both the theory and in the practice of community building. And I want to take a moment to define community because I think it is, <laughs> it is one of those terms that gets thrown around a whole, whole lot, usually in very well-meaning ways, but with lots of different definitions behind it. So I want to be clear what our definition is. Uh, which is that this is an intentional collective of people that are gathering to address common interests and goals. And by our definition, the community really commits to empowering its members to govern its operations and guide its development. So as we open here today, I wanna to credit some of the core members that are in our growing community. Uh, I would be remiss not to begin with the Arcadia Fund, which is uh, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin, and they are our generous funder. And we're so grateful for the support that they have brought to this work. The project team uh, includes not just one lead PI, which is the way things often go. I am a PI on the project, but this project has three PIs that are working in lockstep. So again, I'm Catherine Skinner. Uh, I work with Catherine Mitchell from California Digital Library or CDL and Kristen Rattan from Strategies for Open Science or Stratos. And our project partners on this include the Confederation of Open Access uh, Repositories or CORE as they more often are referred to, Longleaf Services, which is a subsidiary of the UNC Press and Janeway. And we're also working with multiple open source software stakeholders, and you see their logos here too. So the PKP OJS team and ForScience. Uh, ForScience is a leading DSpace code contributor and host for those of you who aren't familiar with them. And then Jane Wei, who I mentioned before, um, is also certainly one of the open source software stakeholders in our project. And we're working closely with two development shops. 
So Cottage Labs in the UK, many of you probably know their work uh, through DOAJ, whether you know it was their work or not. Um, and then Cast Iron Coating, who are based here in the US and are also, I'm sure, known to many of you for the wonderful work that they've been doing on Manifold in the past few years. We also have three of the most extraordinary uh, project staff members imaginable. So we've got Kate Herman, who's our project manager, Dave Kohler, who is our technical product manager, and Sarah Lippincott, who's our product owner on the NGLP software elements. And uh, Sarah Lippincott, I should also say, is instrumental in the values and principles work that we've been doing in this project, which is, again, you know, part, of, part of the heart of the work that we're doing. And each of these stakeholders and individuals, so both the, the teams that are represented by these logos, but also the individuals, really is contributing to a complicated and uh, interlocking set of project pieces with the values and principles work at the heart of the project, uh, influencing and informing all of the work that we do on governance, on software development, and on the pilots, which are the three big pieces within this project. So you see that values and principles loop in the middle, um, and then the influence that it's having on all the things that are uh, a part of this project. We also have a tremendous advisory board and a lot of strategic partners, and those include groups from Crossref to Atmire and from COPUM to the Library Publishing Coalition, or LPC. Uh, our work is also supported by and grounded in the work of a vibrant and deeply engaged community of library practitioners. So NGLP arose directly out of the library publishing community. Um, we, uh, there were ongoing conversations for years that many of you, hopefully, who are a part of today's event with us, were a part of and continue to be a part of, that uh, have talked about, you know, both formally and informally have had these conversations about how we need more robust open source tools on the one hand. But that, that's not enough. It's not just that we need great tools. We also need great services, including hosted services. More and more uh, libraries are moving towards more hosted services. So that's really important. That's still not enough. We want hosted services that are actually run and managed and developed in accordance with academic values. So again, values and principles right down at the heart of this. And as the executive director of Educopia, I've had the pleasure of working for years with the Library Publishing Coalition. We provide scaffolding and hosting support for the LPC community. And so that's brought me into a lot of these conversations. And Catherine Mitchell has been the president of LPC recently, also very much a part of these conversations. And I can say, you know, the NGLP project would not have happened without those conversations. It really has come directly out of those articulated needs that we both heard and, and were a part of uh, the conversations about. That's not the only thing that's influencing it. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we call out a kind of um, sister project that's been happening alongside the NGLP project that really does both inform uh, the NGLP project and also really has a reciprocal relationship with it. And that project is the IMLS funded library publishing workflows project, which is led by Melanie Schlosser of Educopia and of LPC, and then it's project managed by Brandon Locke of Educopia. And that research project has been a huge uh, instrumental moment in just understanding what do workflows actually look like for library publishers? How are they doing their work? And so we've been working with uh, 12 different library publishers to see what different shapes and sizes and types of programs are doing and how those workflows actually are connected and where the point pain points are so that we can really drill down towards those pain points and make sure that what we're producing in the NGLP project is addressing those pain points directly. So NGLP's goal is to expand the range of publishing pathways for authors and for editors and for readers who are seeking to distribute and access knowledge in ways that are value aligned with the academic enterprise. That, that's where we start. And so, as I described just a moment ago, we knew a lot coming into this project. We had been deeply informed, certainly by that set of conversations that were happening in the library publishing uh, community. But still, we needed to check our knowledge, and we knew that. 
um, both as the project started and again at every development moment. So it's one thing to hear lots of reports of pain points and kind of draw your own informal conclusions out of these ad hoc conversations that you get into. It's another thing entirely to design and actualize a solid multifaceted research plan to make sure that you fully understand and are meeting the community's needs. And that's what we've been trying to do. So you can see on this slide, the three phase strategy that we've been taking in order to make sure that we are developing in lockstep with the community. And you're gonna hear a lot more about all of the details as Kristen and Catherine talk about the development work and the forthcoming pilots uh, in just a moment. But for now, suffice it to say that before we started any of that development work, and certainly before we started moving towards pilots, we spent more than a year engrossed in interviews, workshops, focus groups, survey-based work, et cetera, with several hundred library publishing stakeholders during the phase one of our project. <clears throat> and what we heard from them consistently and compellingly was that they want journal and IR solutions first. Other content types certainly matter. They are interested in those other content types, but journals and IR content are what are at the core of the offerings right now, and they're also at the core of the concerns. Um, library publishers told us they want those solutions to be hosted and turnkey where possible, and that they want unified web delivery for their journal and their IR content. They also want open source, community-owned, and governed uh, hosted solutions. So modular architecture uh, that is in the hands of folks that are really trying to work in an academic setting. <clears throat> they also want to make sure that we're not reinventing wheels. So something that we heard loudly and clearly in phase one of our work was work with the things that we already love. Like we know that these tools are not perfect, but we have invested a lot of time and energy in building tools don't throw out the tools we already have. Don't start fresh. Don't try to build something big. Uh, try to build something that actually interlocks those pieces that are already working for us together more effectively. And then we also heard that folks really want help migrating from their current environment into the new options that we are trying to make possible. So we're building very much in the open. Uh, and we can move to the next slide, sorry. Our work is trying to build in the open as much as possible. And community engagement has been at the core from the beginning. Again, we spoke to more than you know, several hundred uh, library publishers and their kind of stakeholder friends within this environment over the course of the project so far. Um, today, we're pleased to be able to share a treasure trove, we hope, of documentation that will take you much deeper into all the elements of the NGLP outputs to date that comprise everything from the technical specifications that we've been building to promotional materials. Um, but a lot of the, the research that undergirds the, the reports that we've already published are going to come up uh, you know, in, in a new repository that we are going to release today or have just released today. Much of the material in that little repository is completely open. Some of the more technical documentation is only accessible with the completion of a brief form. So, and it, it is a brief form and we're not gonna do anything with your information, of course. So that brings me to the question. And I told you I'd make sure that you knew when I was asking the question. So here's the question with a big ta-da. Um, which pressing concerns do you most hope that the library publishing community can collectively address through the NGLP initiative? And if you have thoughts on this, we'd love for you to share that in the chat, whether you do that immediately or whether you do that after a couple of minutes of reflection. I also want to pause for just a moment and see if there are any burning questions uh, for folks from this first segment before we move on and let Catherine and Kristen both talk about some of the specifics of the technical development and the pilots. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, while, we, while we wait for folks to formulate questions, I, I have one that um, I wanted to start with, which is to just ask you to talk about, you know, why community uh, at the core of this? What is the, if you could just state, you know, what is so important about keeping community at the heart of this project? Yeah, I think there are a lot of, I mean, I, I could talk about that for the next hour. So I'm going to keep myself brief and just say that when we build in community, what we build actually satisfies the needs around us and has the investment that it needs from those who are going to be using solutions. So for me, community is not an afterthought. It's not something that you kind of check in with and then hopefully they want what you've built at the end. Community has to build things together. 
And I think that that's one of the things that actually the academic community, that libraries and archives, um, publishers within the academic community, university presses and library publishers, it's one of the biggest assets that we've got is that we have these relationships that we can build across our institutions and these uh, ways of informing ourselves jointly about what it is that we're trying to do and then how we can accomplish it together. And building shared resources is, in my mind, always the most effective and the most useful way to go. And it keeps things in community hands and community controlled. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I'm uh, gonna, in the interest of time, move us on to, to the next section, uh, but uh, folks feel free to please keep uh, uh, dropping any questions in the Q&A uh, and the chat is also open for comments. And I'll mark that Sarah Lippincott's voice since uh, she didn't get a chance to introduce herself, but Sarah Lippincott, who's product owner on this. Great. Well, let's move on. Um, my name is Kristen Rattan, and as Catherine mentioned, I'm one of the co-PIs, um, and I work closely with the product group and the two uh, development shops that we've hired to build some components. So one of our guiding, our second real guiding principle here is interoperability, and I'll say also integration, that allows us to solve challenges uh, that have been identified by the library publishing community without discarding what already works. As Catherine mentioned, the library publishing community specifically said, don't try to reinvent everything. Don't build one platform to rule them all, um, but knit together existing open source platforms and tools, uh, existing service providers, fill the gaps that are there, uh, focus on those and give us a foundation for building a new, for new ideas, new content types, creating new services. So let's start with a firm foundation upon which we can innovate. So we are filling two gaps that were identified with modular components, which I'll cover. And then these combined with existing platforms and a growing service layer, which is really critical, mission aligned service providers, we think will allow library publishers to both streamline their existing workflows, but also find new solutions. And if they want, grow their programs. So the first component that we decided was really needed and that we are building is a unified web discovery and display platform, which we call the web delivery platform or WDP creatively. Um, it's a flexible and content agnostic platform. Um, rather than trying to reinvent, for example, submission systems that have been done very well by OJS or by Janeway, um, <clears throat> or sy systems that uh, for submission of IR content, like the portions of vSpace that handle that, we're building a layer that can ingest and display content um, that's produced in these systems and either replace the delivery of say a journal site or, um, or an IR, or it can operate as an overlay um, and create a place to unify content from different places. So you may be familiar with CDL's e-scholarship. This was one of the inspirations for this type of integrated layer where you can mix content across different, uh, different content areas. Apologies, a dog barks in the distance. The uh, web delivery uh, platform <clears throat> ingests content from widely adopted manuscript submission systems such as OJS and Janeway for journals. And then from DSpace and other IR platforms, it will pull in IR content. Um, <clears throat> but these three platforms were named most frequently by the library publishing community as things that they would like to keep in place and build on. So the web delivery platform, however, can also ingest migrated content and data from other existing platforms and services. So if somebody wants to move, for example, out of an existing service and into something new, the web delivery platform is poised to be able to pull that content in and offer library publishers interesting and creative ways to work with that content. So once content is pulled into the web delivery platform, library publishing administrators can work with it in various ways. They can have it flow straight through into journal sites, they can mix and match content collections. 
the web delivery platform also offers uh, the ability to create hierarchies of brands um, and collections so that different units, departments, or groups within the campus can have their own web space. Um, and that there's a lot of flexibility with applying for different design templates and things to those collections. So it offers a huge amount of flexibility and opportunity to meet the needs of various different stakeholder groups. Um, the minimum viable product or MVP for this web delivery platform will display content as PDFs, but we're building in the capacity to also offer full text HTML in the next phase of development. Um, and it's built with all the modern discoverability capabilities, uh, up-to-date metadata standards, fields for persistent identifiers, for example, built to meet the requirements of search engines for, such as Google, Google Scholar, et cetera. Um, and that means that all of the scholarly outputs are on an equal footing. A white paper or a student thesis looks as polished and is just as discoverable as a, a digital first journal article, for example. Um, and then nesting these communities, as I mentioned, allows for customization. So you can manage, a, as a library publisher, you can manage a full portfolio and also delegate control to journal editors or department heads or other people within the university system. The other component that we're working on is um, a unified analytics tool. So we call this one the AD. The AD aggregates workflow and impact metrics from upstream systems and packages them into compelling visualizations. So pulling workflow uh, information out of, for example, OJS or Janeway or DSpace, um, such as the time to, to first decision or time to publication, and then pulling that together with, uh, with metrics from all of the other platforms, as well as impact metrics from a, any sort of web delivery platform. That, that includes things like downloads and page views. So then access, and allows you to mix and match that information and create reports. Access to those reports can be delegated by a library publisher administrator, um, and metrics can also then be returned back to the web delivery platform if it, for example, displaying the number of page views or downloads on an article or an item page is desired. So workflow reports uh, compile metrics on content flow through these systems. So we're pulling information right out of Janeway or, uh, or OJS, um, giving publishers and editors insight into capacity, efficiency, um, time to first decision or acceptance. You can see where there may be back backlogs across multiple workflow streams. Uh, and sort of let's go to uh, the next slide, Dave, and take a look at what some of these reports look like. So this is some example reports uh, that are done early on for MVP that show things like article downloads, um, and you can slice this information by multiple different ways. So one thing that's interesting to people is being able to see, for example, geolocation data on a map. What we've done that's a little bit unique is we're making sure that all of this data is normalized in a database from which you can then derive map-based views, but other kinds of views as well by any sort of demographic so that you can really create and mine the data and create compelling reports. The MVP will come out with a certain set of canned reports that we'll then be able to build on over time and also build out custom reporting tools. Um, <clears throat> the workflow tools, uh, uh, metrics, I think are of great interest when library publishers are working directly, for example, with journal editors or other stakeholders who uh, are using submission systems. And this, will, this pulls out, as I mentioned earlier, things like you know, the timing and the volume of, of uh, submitted to accepted, et cetera. And this really allows people to monitor those pipelines. We took... Uh, uh, input from CDL, who you know manages quite a large journal program, and one of the pain points they had was being able to see where things are you know stopped up and back backed up in the pipelines, and this allows for that type of activity. So our timeline on this is um, these MVPs for these two components will be ready by roughly April of 2022, at which point we're launching several pilots, uh, which we'll talk about in the next section. Um, <clears throat> it's important to understand that in addition to building the two MVPs, we're building ways for them to integrate with these, uh, with these other tools we've mentioned. So we're building in 
ingest mechanisms uh, for content to be pulled, for example, from Janeway, one of our key partners, into this web delivery system for metrics to be able to flow back and forth. So these integration points, um, I think we believe allow for anyone to pull together any combination of these components and spin up new services. Um, so our goal is not to define what the ideal platform is. Our goal is to help create an ecosystem in which people can define their own solutions. So we imagine some people may only need the analytics dashboard because they have the other components that they want, or someone may want to replace their front end and just use the web delivery platform, et cetera. So the opportunity to mix and match these components and then to be able to include new components, other IR systems, for example, other you know, journal tools, um, and then of course, tools for other content types like books and OER over time. So we're creating this modular architecture into which we can plug multiple different components. Um, so one of our big open questions here that we'd love your thoughts on, um, and we, we are uh, obviously constantly pondering, is which of these features in the stack are most valuable to your publishing programs? We're digging into the different features um, on the web delivery platform, reader facing features, library administer, administration facing features, um, which are the things that where you have pain points now with content flow and production, where things need to tie up together or issues around discoverability, uh, is content not really being able to be visible in multiple places? Connectivity, uh, take a shout out right now to the core next generation library publishing, um, uh, next generation, sorry, repository project, which is really trying to increase the ability for content to flow through and standards to be uh, um, uh, placed in all of the different platforms that exist today, that kind of decentralized notion. So we have um, a moment for Q&A, but I also want to mentioned that we have multiple ways for you to interact with us that we'll be talking about during this. So throw a question into the QRA or the chat, but also uh, look for ways to engage with us um, through our request for comments that Catherine mentioned, where we've placed a huge amount of documentation and information available. And there are Google Forms for you to interact with there. Um, or join one of our user groups. Uh, we have user groups that are going deep with us. Uh, we're so excited to have more than 30 library publishers involved in those user groups today and plenty of room for more. And that's a way to get in and shape some of these tools uh, to make sure that they meet your needs. So we'll pause for a minute and see if there are any questions coming up. I have a question for you. Um, we have a lot of interest from schools and departments on research impact at that level. Would love to see more about what the web interface looks like for an IR slash DSpace collection. Will those interfaces include metrics at the collection level? Yes, it's a great question. And the answer is absolutely yes. The, the, by taking a really database driven approach for the analytics dashboard, it means you can slice that data in many, many different ways. And over time we'll be in our hopefully phase two development, we'll be able to allow you to actually have access to mining tools to do some of that. Um, but definitely the goal is to, uh, in the same way that you'd get journal specific metrics, you should be able to get metrics specific to any collection or group of collections. Thanks, Kristen. Um, uh, we will move on to the next section to, to keep us moving. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm Catherine Mitchell from the California Digital Library and another co-PI uh, co on this project. Um, and I'm here to talk about scalability. Scalability is our third guiding principle, and we want to make sure that our solutions work well for a range of use cases, institutional contexts, and service models. So in the same way that we're prioritizing data portability and interoperability in our infrastructure, we're seeking to offer compelling and powerful solutions for many different publishing scenarios. So using the modular architecture we've been describing, NGLP is launching three pilot implementations in the first quarter of 2022, as you just heard. We've intentionally structured these project pilots to test three different hosting models in order to demonstrate the feasibility of supporting this work within First, an institution-based combined journal and IR provider, 
uh, hosted by Janeway. Second, a consortial library publisher hosted by the California Digital Library. And third, a nonprofit journal services provider hosted by Longleaf Services. So each pilot is each pilot host is engaging in this work to test the long-term feasibility of both the technical and service models they're assembling, using the pilot phase to define and document the tools, data, support services, including client engagement and help desks, workflows, and all of the other resources that will be required to shift from a pilot to a full service implementation. The pilots are designed to test and demonstrate the relevance of this modular technology for addressing the needs of the community including those library publishing programs looking for a nonprofit mission aligned alternative to commercial platforms, consortial library publishers seeking to upgrade their technology stack and institution based publishers looking to establish a journals publishing program. Beyond addressing these specific needs, the pilots are also designed to help communicate the value of such efforts to administrators who are considering institutional investment in these areas. So to get a bit more specific, here's what each of the pilots, pilots will look like. And you can see there's a, there's a table here, but uh, I'll get into a little more detail. So in the first one, including a, a combined journals and IR solution with an elegant display layer and powerful reporting tools, pilot one will use Janeway as a journal manuscript submission system and DSpace for IR submission and management under the hood and will provide unified display of content and metadata from both sources through the WDP. The analytics dashboard will merge usage data from both platforms and provide unified reporting. This pilot will offer a hosted turnkey solution for library publishers looking to license a hosted platform that will fulfill their journal publishing and IR needs. Including the same modular technologies as the combined journal and IR hosted solution pilot, pilot two will focus on serving the needs of large scale consortial publishing environments. As the library publisher for the University of California, CDL currently publishes more than 85 open access journals and has over 300,000 open access items in its IR. But its underlying technology is in need of a substantial refresh, believe me. Uh, CDL staff will load substantial amounts of our journal and IR content and data into the system to verify its fitness for a complex multi-institutional publishing program. This pilot will demonstrate how a library publisher running local technology can leverage components of the NGLP modular architecture to upgrade and expand established consortial library services. And finally, pilot three demonstrates the ability to build coalitions and scale across library publishers in much the same way that CDL has done, but working through a nonprofit mission aligned publishing services partner, in this case, Longleaf. The pilot will focus on journals initially with the aspiration to expand to books later. Longleaf has identified an initial set of interested library based publishing initiatives across the 17 campus University of North Carolina system who are either seeking a more robust solution for self hosted publications or who are uh, interested in outsourcing the platform and some editorial services associated with campus based journals to a third party. The pilot will also explore the opportunity to aggregate the display of these individual publications under a consortial institution based identity and it will serve as a demonstration case for university administration that library publishing can scale and that there are trusted open source platforms and reliable service providers in the space. But this isn't all we have in mind. We are in conversation also with um, PKP, uh, as OJS was previously mentioned, and for science about other another kind of pilot that would be uh, that would include OJS and DSpace. Uh, so we're looking at you know as many configurations as we can imagine with the main tools that the that the, the campus university based publishing uh, community um, is using, and um, and there are uh, ways in which the tools we are building might also be piloted distinctly. So for example, somebody could run the AD, um, the analytics dashboard, with a, an entirely different system just to. Uh, take advantage of those reporting tools. So related to the pilot work, we are keen to engage with the community on this question. What are the barriers you most often face in transitioning to new solutions for your publishing program? And what could we do to facilitate your participation in the NGLP pilots? There are lots of ways to respond to this question. As has been mentioned, um, you can pop a, a thought in the, in the Q&A or, um, or uh, join our user group meetings or you know, contact us directly. This is really, really important because we recognize that it's not enough just to build these solutions and 
and you know uh, and establish these service models, it's really important to help facilitate um, the engagement with the community and to understand what the barriers are there. So I want to pause here in case anyone has any particular thoughts at this moment. I'll just pause briefly. Tell us your pain points. Uh, Catherine, while we're waiting for that, I, I wanted to just talk about the fact that these pilots are an opportunity for us to test these new service layers and environments. Um, uh, but it's also an opportunity for you as a library publisher to try something. Uh, they, need, they won't be arduous. The Journal Plus IR uh, pilot that is being run by Janeway um, is a fairly simple one to participate in. We'll do the heavy lifting. And it's a way for you to, without making any changes to your current uh, solution, you can, uh, you can give us a try and see what happens and have the opportunity to get in early and shape this to be what, what you need over time. So uh, raise your hand if you're interested in that. Again, we have links uh, that you can do to let us know. We're in the process of uh, uh, gathering up those who are interested um, and just having a one-on-one -on -one with you to see what your thoughts are, what your pain points are, what your ambitions might be for your program and how there may be a fit for a pilot. So signing up to have one of those meetings is certainly no obligation, but we're really excited to have some already on board, some library publishers from our user groups, uh, but the door is still open to others to participate in some of these pilots. A few, I'll relay a few things from, from the chat. Um, a lot of, uh, of kind of um, comments relating to the lack of staff time and expertise or specifically developer resources in-house as a, a barrier to, uh, to implement, implementing new tools and platforms. Um, Catherine or, or, or Kristen, do you want to speak a little bit to, to the ways in which NGLP is, uh, is, is uh, addressing that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I, I think that's a really, really relevant and, and probably very widespread uh, concern. Um, and as Kristen was just suggesting, um, this particular pilot with Janeway should really um, you know, mitigate those issues significantly because it's a hosted solution. And so you don't need to be running technology locally. You don't need to have somebody handling workflow uh, you know, forms and processes. You don't need any of that in-house. That, that all gets handled. Um, by Janeway as the host running the IR and the journal uh, management system. So, it, you know, this is one of the cases in which it's important to have, or it's an example of why it's so important to have different pilot models, because there are a lot of different shapes and sizes to library publishing programs. And we're really interested in thinking about having, a, you know, a, a range of solutions that address each of those issues. Um, and uh, that doesn't address the issue of a lack of time, obviously, because you know even a, you know a, establishing a, a pilot even with a hosted solution requires a little bit of, of investment in engaging with the service provider to make sure that your requirements are, are 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 served well. But I think that it's time well spent in this case, and it's also the case that. Um, and I just want to sort of finish this up by saying, you know, we have these two fully developed pilots that are already sort of underway. At, uh, at CDL for the University of California Library Publishing Program and at, um, at, at uh, sorry, Longleaf for the UNC uh, Journals Publishing Program. But um, we are really, really interested, as Kristen said, in, in establishing more partners for the Journal Plus IR hosted solution with Janeway. And it's important to note that there's very little risk here also. Um, this pilot would run alongside any existing system that you have. So it's not the case that you would have to sort of dive in and you know, migrate all of your content up front. You would be, it would be a demonstration pilot. So you could see what does my co content look like in the stack? What, you know, what kinds of services am I, am I likely to receive in a production service here? Um, and um, so it, wouldn't, you know, it won't be ready to replace any live platforms during the pilot period but it would give you direct insight into and influence over the software and service model development that will be underway throughout the pilot period, you know, based on the feedback that we receive. So um, I don't know if there's, uh, it sounds like, um, will there be a DSpace and OJS pilot? 
Um, we absolutely intend to have that. It's not in this round, but we've been talking with PKP. They're extremely interested. They're ready. Um, it's really a matter of timing. And, um, but we also recognize that OJS is so, uh, you know, extensively utilized in this space that it really is necessary to, um, to be thinking in terms of multiple systems. And it's part of the design of the project for it to be modular and interoperable and mix and match as needed. Um, I'll just add to that real quick that, uh, that both PKP and For Science are in, involved in the project. And so again, although there's not an official pilot happening in this project period of DSpace and OJS, there will be some unofficial testing certainly happening and they are contributing to the governance and business model conversations in recognition that this is part of what is available to them um, within their own hosting platforms. Yeah, that's a really good point. And you know, it's it, just because they're not part of this pilot, this round of pilots doesn't mean there will not be. There's there's right. deep interest in that and recognition of the need for it. Um, I want to go back up to um, Celia Rosa's uh, point that there aren't enough analysts, so they need to evaluate platforms without expertise. One of the nice things about this project is that it it derives directly from the community and from community identified platforms that are already trusted. Um, and from community identified requirements, which are already well established. So, um, you know, we're not guessing at this. We've, you know, we've done extensive work with library publishers and we understand where they see strong solutions, where they see gaps and what they need. Um, and so I think that one of the things that is a benefit of, of getting involved here is that you sort of are standing on the shoulders of all of your peer institutions who are already, you know, engaging with the same problems and you don't have to figure it out yourself. Um, and uh, one other question about Samvera, Haiku and Hyrax. That's a great question. We are not yet in conversation with those folks, but again, you know, the, the more the merrier here. This is not about identifying a couple of platforms and saying these are the only ones that are worth working with. It's really about thinking how, how can we create these service layers and these display and um, uh, sort of uh, data uh, layers on top of any number of systems on the back end? That's the goal here. And, and, and I, uh, Kristen, Catherine, do you want to say anything about that? I was just going to add to that that um, <clears throat> there is an, th this project came from an acknowledgement that there are a lack of resources here in this space that the library publishing community doesn't have a lot of resources. And it was through the general, sort of the visionary and generous funding from Arcadia that we're able to channel funds and all of the time and expertise of this team, including all of our partners towards fixing problems in this space. Um, and it's that creating that knitting, you know, tying of things together, taking all of the voices from the library publishing community, investing in the technology and services to sort of bring the whole community up. Um, that's the goal of NGLP. And we know it, it would have been hard to do otherwise, probably impossible. So, but NGLP itself is really just here as a facilitator to, to be that connective tissue. Um, to make sure that these things can happen. So that, you know, looking at what other components and what other technologies like Samvera, Haiku, et cetera, need to come in over time, bringing, uh, you know, moving forward with a uh, PKP and maybe for science driven OJS plus DSpace pilot, which they weren't quite ready to do due to other commitments, but we all want to see it happen. These are all the things that NGLP can help make sure happen and, and pull together. So it's been really exciting to be able to um, just be in this, in this connective tissue space and work with everybody to achieve their own goals. Because the fact is we have the right ingredients here. We have the community, that we have the will, we have a lot of great technologies. We have the ability to, again, thanks to Arcadia, invest in some new components. And we have the ability to say, how, what does a fully functioning ecosystem with service, you know, mission aligned service providers look like? And so this is, uh, it's a fantastic project to be able to be a part of and, uh, and hoping that more of you want to get involved too. We have a lot of involvement so far from the library publishing community, but plenty of room for more. Thanks. Thank you, Kristen and, and Catherine um, for uh, for all of that, I'm going to move us on to the next section. Well, it was a perfect segue. It is a great segue, <laughs> Kristen. Uh, I will flag just 
just before we do that, there was one question in the Q and A about whether we were considering pilot uh, partners who aren't currently running any system. I just wanted to, you know, say a resounding yes, absolutely. You don't have to be running any of the systems we've just mentioned. If you're running OJS and you're interested in a future OJS pilot, please do reach out. Whatever stage you're you're at in your um, in developing your publishing program, whichever uh, platforms you're currently using, even if they're not part of our current uh, pilot stack. Um, and I'll hand it back over to, to Catherine. Yeah, the more of those conversations that we can have, the better we're gonna be able to really meet you all where you are. So again, that that is a lot of what we're trying to do here. And I think it's it's signified in the slide that's up now. So can we develop values aligned services that operate with sustainable business models? Um, you know, again, the, those of you who know me know that I have been uh, a longstanding um, champion of community based approaches and community governed approaches. Um, I will also say that I agree with both uh, Melanie Schlosser and Catherine Mitchell, who wrote a beautiful piece a couple of years ago, maybe about two years ago now on how troubling those terms and their usage are and how how difficult it is to make sure that things that call themselves community based um, self anointed or community governed really are. And so one of the things that underscores everything else in this project is that we have been doing deep dives into values and principles, both in terms of the literature that's out there, all of the examples from the 1980s forward of uh, you know, declarations and manifestos and letters and all of these different ways that, uh, that the academic community at large and libraries as a piece of that <clears throat> have been uh, trying to articulate what it is that we believe in and what we want the services, tools, and infrastructure that we're working with in scholarly communication to abide by. Um, and then trying to ask, okay, why is it that we've been having that conversation since the 1980s, including with some really well-developed pieces like Force 11's, uh, or it came out of some Force 11 work, the Open Scholarly Principles, which is now moving into this posy um, kind of space. Why is it that we still don't really have a values aligned service environment that we can see and understand. Um, and so part of what we've spent a lot of the first year and a half of this project on and that we're now maturing up in a second phase is writing up you know, what, what does values and principles driven work really look like? What is it that we're trying to signify when we say that? And how can you assess it? So not just claim it, but how can you actually assess it and not assess it in some punitive way, like, oh, finger wagging, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, but instead trying to incentivize all players. I don't care where they're coming from, the commercial players, non-commercial players, the ones that are embedded in academic institutions, the library publishers themselves, all of us need to be incentivized to behave according to our values. And I think, and our team definitely thinks that that is key to making what has been a very imbalanced and inefficient and overpriced infrastructure of scholarly publishing, bringing that back into alignment with uh, academic values could really transform this system in ways that I don't think anything else can. And while POSI and things like that are a step in the right direction, a beautiful step in the right direction, they are still saying, self-anoint and tell us about how you correspond to these values rather than having any absolute explicit things that we say, okay, this is what this value means. And here are a range of ways that you can actually address it. So some of the questions that we're asking in the project and we are genuinely asking them, that it may, it may be that we find that, that that assessment level is not necessary. But one of the big questions we're asking in this project is, is that part of the lever system that we haven't pushed yet that needs to be in place in order for folks to really be incentivized to work in business models that are aligning with our values and principles. So I'm gonna turn it to both of my co-PIs here, uh, to Kristen and Catherine and open this up more as a conversation. You know, a lot of this project is about designing governance structures and business models that stay value, values aligned um, and that also provides sustainable revenue. 
So, you know, Kristen and Catherine, uh, you want to talk about some of the things we've been doing, including the business modeling work that or frameworks that we're trying to uh, to get off the ground now? Uh, sure, I can start. Um, so, uh, you know, in the land of open source in general, there are a variety of successful sustainability models that work that are tend the most successful tend to be community driven. <clears throat> where contributions are coming and by contributions, it could be everything from contributing code, contributing funds, as well as contributing ideas and time, you know, and kind of uh, insights. Um, all of those things feeding into open source projects are, are you know, those tend to be the things that uh, um, um, lead for successful, sustainable models, all that contribution. Uh, also having a healthy service layer the, where the service providers, they could be the platform builders themselves, or they could be uh, others who are invested in those technologies. Um, and then they're focusing their efforts on the services only. Either way, it means that there is a, um, uh, a ability to have a real customer, uh, a diverse and happy customer base that feeds in to the sustainability of both service provider and technology provider. So again, there are lots of models out there that we, we have looked at and we can, and we're you know, always keeping an eye out for that. And so our question here is, is how to take that knowledge, how to take those models and build a framework within our business development, our business modeling group, build a framework to say, okay, what kind of service is gonna work well for a consortial library publisher? What kind of service is gonna work well for somebody offering a unified IR and journal uh, service um, that can compete in, with the commercial world? What is, does it look like for um, uh, a university-based nonprofit uh, journal service provider to be able to <clears throat> step up and meet the needs, for example, of nonprofit um, uh, journal uh, societies or university presses even, um, and others uh, within the library publishing community too. So those are all kind of the, the questions that we're exploring in that business modeling group. and. Uh, it's really exciting because this is the missing piece in a lot of ways. This is the piece that without which everything still operates as individual silos. So, you know, we talked about connective tissue. This is a key portion of that connective tissue uh, that we're working on. Yeah, yes. and I'll just, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Catherine. <clears throat> I was just going to say um, yes to all of that. And also um, sort of acknowledging again, a lot of the comments that have come into the Q and A um, about limited resources. So uh, we, we know that the library, I mean, I know the library publishing um, community is significantly under-resourced for the kinds of ambitions and opportunities that it offers its institutions. And so the goal here is to create sustainability with a recognition that there often um, isn't a budget to, you know, to, uh, to really resource these areas um, as they should be in terms of staffing, in terms of licensing. Um, so it's about, you know, pitching this just right, hitting the sweet spot where, you know, this is uh, affordable and, um, you know, within, makes sense within the context of library budgets um, in its structure and its cost, but also um, allows for those resources to go back to the open source communities and the open source tools and, and solutions um, to help sustain them for the future so that it's a stable ecosystem and we don't have partners, you know, um, failing because there wasn't a good model. And, and as Kristen has said, there are good models out there. It's about uh, tailoring these models to this community so that there is a sustainable uh, future for the library publishing programs and their infrastructure. So we, we come at this with a very keen understanding of what resourcing looks like here and a desire to, to engage um, in a way that makes good sense for that resourcing and also results in really significantly improved tools and services. It's not about sort of eking out um, something that's just good enough. It's about improving the quality of the, of the kinds of platforms that we use to provide those publishing services. Yeah, and I think it really comes back to this connective tissue idea that Kristen was talking about. On the one hand, we need that connective tissue on a technical level to make it possible for these systems to interoperate that have them way, way, way too siloed. Um, and, and that we've all known, I mean, we've been talking about that for years, um, but starting to build some of those pathways 
for these systems to come together and and really be able to be used in tandem with one another and you know building new services on top of them. Um, we also need that connective tissue in transparency around business modeling. So part of what we're trying to encourage here is for those previously siloed and sometimes collaborative. I mean, you know, a good example is uh, for science, you know, partners regularly with PKP and also with DSpace. You know, there, there are partnerships out there, but they tend to be kind of one to one partnerships instead of many to many partnerships. And part of what we're trying to explore here with the Business Frameworks Working Group is how can we broaden that? How can we really think about the reciprocity that needs to be there between service providers who are building on open source software and the open source developers who are creating the code that it all hinges on? And then how do we do that in a way that that isn't abusive to, you know, it's not, again, it's not punitive. It's not, um, it, it's not designed to make some folks look bad or to have a one size fits all expectation. But instead, how do we how do we use transparency around business models and work to really build that reciprocity into business models to elevate the whole field and lift all the ships? Um, and the last thing that I want to say, and then I'm going to flip it back to Kristen, is that NGLP itself isn't meant to be a new heavy piece of the system. So NGLP is coming in here, and as Kristen said before, we're facilitators. None of us are benefiting directly in a long-term way from this project. We're not bringing up an organization or a new community around NGLP itself as something else that needs to be maintained. What we want is for this to be a piece of the glue and a piece of the infrastructure that helps all of the groups come together and think about how they can co-maintain these items. And in that way, we're, you know, in deep conversation with uh, Invest in Open Infrastructure, which Kristen and I both were uh, co-founders and steering committees for, um, and also in, in conversation with other initiatives like that, that are trying to look at the system level to see what, what can we do differently around funding and around expectations in order to really transform what we've all known was broken for a long time. Yeah, and uh, just uh, building on that a little, there's there was a lot um, that the community asked for um, that we're not able to address in this first round. Um, there was a whole set of wishes that moved into other content types like books and OER. Um, there were wishes around new features and functionality, having the you know all the content in full text HTML, for example. Oh, there are wishes around reducing this costs by getting more economy of scale, pooling, you know, production resources, things like that. So many interesting things that we'd like to get to in another phase, um, because what we're doing here is creating that layer, that firm layer of foundation to be able to do much, much more and to be able to innovate. You know, there, there is there are a lot of there's a lot of interest in open scholarship, in data, in other things that libraries could work on if they have kind of those economies of scale from which to build. Um, and I know we're at the end of time, but so I wanted to just um, mention if we could um, go to the last slide there. Um, that we want you to participate. Come join us, do things. Uh, we have put a lot of documentation out there in that first link. Uh, all these links will go in the chat and they'll all be available uh, after. Um, join one of our user groups. It's a low lift. It's you know an hour, hour and a half meeting once every six weeks or something, but you get to participate, hear a lot more detail and also give us your thoughts and ideas to help you know influence how this goes. Or if you want to want to hear more about being a pilot partner, just schedule a time to talk with us about that. Or if you just want to talk to us and see what, what's going on and hear more, please do that. And then Kate, our fantastic project manager's email is right there. And, uh, and she's always available to just hear what might be of interest to you. So there's a lot in that documentation. There's the opportunity to actually put comments and thoughts in there. So that's a really easy way to just you know, engage with with what we're what we're putting out there. We're working in the open here, so this information is all for you to uh, consume and and think about.
Thank you, oh, Kristen. Thanks. And um, we will be sending out a link to the recording for this uh, forum after the fact. And, and we look forward to, to continuing to talk with you all and, and hope you'll follow up with us. And thanks for all those thanks in the chat. It's really nice to see all this enthusiasm. And for your time today. Yeah, it's great. It's really great to have all these people involved. Um, and we look forward to engaging with all of you again soon.